All right, well, it is good to be here. I feel like in the summer, where everybody's kind of like coming and going, and we're all like, hey, hey, see you in three weeks, you know, and it feels like a lot of that in the summer, um, but it's, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord and worshiping together, and the presence of God is just always here, and I'm so, so grateful. Um, well, we are going to spend the next two weeks talking about the prophetic. Um, let's go. Let's go. Let's see where we go. I mean, we're going somewhere. Um, I, I've had this in my, in my spirit for a while. The prof- this is a very, this is a culture that loves the prophetic. We love to hear God. We love to, to lean into what God is saying. Um, I also recognize that, that the prophetic is something that most people feel some kind of way about. Some kind of way about it, right? Um, you maybe have had really positive experiences with the prophetic, and that makes me very happy. You may have had like no experiences with the prophetic, and you're like, what actually is that? Is that freaky? Is that weird? Is that biblical? What is that? You might have had negative experiences with the prophetic and have been seen it, you know, used in a way that feels just out of alignment, feels a little bit manipulative, feels a little bit weird, and kind of stand off to it. You know, or maybe you're just inquisitive about it, but I know in a group like this, we're such diverse backgrounds, we all kind of have maybe different experiences or perspectives, and my hope and prayer is that in the next two Sundays, we can really kind of unpack some of this together. You can't unpack all of the prophetic in two weeks, but start a conversation, really kind of just start digging into this together as a community, laying a foundation. Um, today, I, I want to go a little bit broader. Next week, I want to get much more like practical. So I want to encourage you, if you're missing one of those weeks, to make sure to tune in. Um, I want to go next week much more into the kind of how to, what to do, what not to do, how, you know, how do you receive a word, how do you give a word, how, how, just all those kinds of things. Um, but I, I want to start. There's so many stories about the prophetic that I love. Um, but I want to tell two specifically this morning because I love them. But I, it, it really um, highlights what I want to share about the prophetic today. Um, some of you, if you've been here a while, you've heard, maybe heard these stories. But um, one of them, you know, for years we, we've taught kids how to hear God's voice. First, you hear God for yourself because everybody can hear God, right? We're all created to hear God's voice. So God is a God who speaks. We can all hear him. So teaching kids that we can all hear him. And from that overflow. Not only can you hear God for yourself, but you can hear God for your friend. You can hear God for your neighbor. You can hear God for somebody else. And so teaching this to kids, and we were training this group of kids, and um, we were going to actually take them out to do prophetic evangelism, which is a fancy way of saying they were going to practice hearing God, they were going to make a card, and they were going to write down what they felt like God was saying, and they were going to find somebody and give it to them. And so um, we're doing that, and, and this one little boy, I'm watching him, he's making his card, and it's very detailed. And on his card, his, that he's praying and he's asking God for a word, he, he makes, you know, draws this whole picture, and he, the card says, God loves you and your tattoos. And there's a picture on the card of a man with blue jeans, a black shirt, a black bandana, and kid version of tattoos on the sky. And I was like, this was so specific, I thought, I feel like he must know who this person is, right? And so I was like, do you know who you're giving it to? He's like, yeah, this guy right here. And I'm like, yeah, but like, do you know him? He's like, well, I've seen him. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I was like, you know, it's probably his neighbor or something. I'm like, where'd you see him? He's like, in the spirit, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> my bad. And, um, and so he, he has this card and, you know, he, he felt like he was to go in, in a particular group that was going to... Um, I believe it was Walmart, and, um, and so he gets in the van that's going to that group, and with that group, and he's walking around, and he's praying, and he's saying, God, you know, help me find the person that you wanted to give this message to, and he's, you know, he is very adamant, you know, this guy's got on blue jeans, got a black shirt, very, very specific, right, so he's looking all over Walmart for this guy and can't find him. And, you know, I, I, we're starting to do the whole, like, well, sometimes it's about timing. You know, we're starting to do the, all the, like, adult pastoral, like, trying to, you know, fill in the gaps for God. Like, God's got not big enough to handle himself. I don't know. Like, we're just doing all the things. And, and he's just like, no, you know. And so it's now time to leave. And we're like, you know, I'm sure God's going to show you this guy at another time or whatever. And so we're, we're leaving. And we're like, we got to go. And he's like, you know, 
I guess I'll just give this card to somebody. So he just walks up to somebody and, and um, you know, and he says, excuse me, do you have tattoos? And the guy's like, no. And he's like, well, here's a card. And the guy was actually very rude. And he said, I don't want your stupid card. And the kid was devastated, right? It's okay. It, it, it was okay. He was fine. But he was devastated in the moment. And he's just like so sad, like just so sad walking back to the van. And he's like, I know I, know I saw this. I know God wants to encourage this guy, you know. And we're walking, he's walking back to the van. And all of a sudden, freaks our team out. This kid just darts and takes off running across the Walmart parking lot. And we're like, don't get that car. You know, he's just running. And we're like, we're responsible for somebody else's kid. What is going on? And he takes off. And we're chasing this kid. And we realize that across the parking lot, he sees a man with blue jeans and a black shirt. And he runs up to this guy. And we get there. And the guy's covered in tattoos. He's got a black bandana on. And the kid literally tells him, where have you been? You almost missed your word from God. I'm not even kidding. And this guy was like, what is happening? Right? He's like, you almost missed it. Like he was so intense. Right? And the guy's like, what's going on? He hands him the card and he sees a picture of himself in his outfit, him. And it says, God loves you and your tattoos. And this grown man begins to weep in the Walmart parking lot. And we're like, okay, I guess that meant something, you know? And this guy gets down on his knees. He's looking eye to eye with this kid. And he just begins to prod his heart. And he's like, do you know that I have always felt rejected by God and never felt like I could go to the church because of how I look, my tattoos. And I've always felt like God doesn't love me. And he goes, this is literally the one thing that makes me feel like God really hears me and sees me. That is little boy led the man to Jesus in the Walmart parking lot that day. Let's go. All because he was listening, God, what's on your heart? God, what do you want to say? And he was willing to partner with him to release it. So simple. Paper and crayons, right? There wasn't a, the, say it, the Lord. Like, that didn't even have to happen. (laughs) Sorry if that's your vibe. But that didn't have to happen. Like, it was simple. It was like, it was, it was enough, right? I love that story. Um, another one, similarly, you know, um, we, we take teams often to Ecuador. Many of you know this. Um, we do a lot of work in the red light district. You know this. Um, we were with a team one time and it was late at night and we're in this area. Um, all kinds of things going on. Drugs, um, prostitution, Anything and everything you can imagine, it's all happening around us. So we have very clear rules that we ask you know, people that are on outreach with us to follow. And um, without going, I'm not going to explain them all, but one of our rules is um, because we're there particularly, we, we have a home, we help women coming out of the sex trade. So we're, we're building relationship. We've been out there for 17 years. Um, they know us by name. This is like something we're there every single week. We've had a lot of relationship. But we're also also winning over brothel owners and pimps. And so part of that is um, one of the rules we've established is, is when a woman is being solicited, we don't walk up to her in that moment because now you're interfering in a business deal. We want to keep the pimps happy because they allow us to love on these women and minister to them, okay? So that's what we do. So that's our rule. If somebody is being solicited, that's not the time you walk up and check on her, see what she needs, see if she needs groceries for the week or whatever, right? That's not the moment. And so, but we always tell our team, before you walk up to somebody, you pray and you ask God what he wants to say to them. And so our team's praying. They see this girl. She's by herself. Um, They know she's working, but she's alone. And so um, begin to ask God for a word for her. So the team gets rocked because they're like, we got a word for her. They walk up to her. As they're walking towards her, right in that moment, this guy intersects and begins to solicit her. And we're like, no. You know, our team is like, no, God had something for her. This is like such a bummer. And so they back off, and um, she begins to walk off with the guy. And um, in that moment, everybody on the team begins to feel the same thing. We actually have to chase her down. And so there was like that oh, I don't know, you know, so everybody prays together, God, is that what you're saying? The leader of the team is like, yeah, that feels, I don't know, I, I'm in agreement, we feel like we're supposed to do it. So they, they chase this woman down. Now, they had a word for the woman. They had nothing for the guy. 
They'd seen the guy all of like 20 seconds. They don't have any kind of deep prophetic word for him. There's no plan. They're just like, I don't know. God loves them. I don't know why we got to chase them down. But it was this, we have to chase them down. That was the thought they kept getting. So they run and chase them down. And as they do, they get to them. They're kind of like, uh, conquer and divide. So half of them take, you know, start speaking to the woman and just, you know, encouraging her. The other half look to the guy. And they have not prepared a word. And they're like, Holy Spirit, right? Like, help. And so they look at him. And the first thing that comes out of their mouth is they begin to say, Sir, God made us chase you down. God made us chase you down. We're not supposed to be doing this. But God made us chase you down. And then right then the rest of the word came. And they looked him in the face and they said, Sir, God wants you to know your mess is not too big for him. Your mess is not too big for him. This man begins to just lose it. I mean, he is weeping. He's freaking out. We're like, that felt very vanilla. Very basic, very entry level, okay. (laughs) Apparently that was something, you know. He begins to just tell his whole story. Of course the woman, she's already getting, she was rocked just seeing us. She knew we were there, you know. She, She was already getting rocked by God. But this guy, what was going on was so wild. And he begins to like, wait, what did you say? And they just kept saying, God made us chase you down, sir, to tell you your mess is not too big for him. He's like, say it again. And they just kept like, okay. So they're like say, saying, he cannot believe what he's hearing. And he begins to tell our team his story. And he said, you know, I used to be a follower of Jesus. And I made a lot of bad choices and a lot of bad decisions and I got really far from God. And I've created such a mess in my family and in my business and in my life. It is so bad, it's so, it's so complex, it's so disgusting, it's so bad. I've, dis- I've made a plan, I cannot continue anymore. And so he said, I decided that tomorrow I'm gonna murder my wife and I'm gonna take my own life. Everything's ready, everything's in place, Everything is set. I've planned this for months. And he said, on my last night, I came down here to get a prostitute. And he goes, but this morning when I was in the shower, I told God, the only thing that could convince me that you're good and that you could actually fix this whole mess, you would have to literally send an angel to chase me down, stand in my face and tell me that you're big enough for my mess. Outside of that, God, I I can't believe it. Come on, somebody, somebody better give God a little bit of praise for that one. This is the goodness of our God. This is also the power of the prophetic, leaning into the heart of God for our neighbors, for those around us, and releasing his heart over people. Lives are changed, things shift, transformation happens through this beautiful thing called the prophetic. So I want to, in talking about the prophetic, I want to start with a very basic truth, which um, might feel very elementary, but it's something that we have to really get settled in us if we're really going to be able to step into the prophetic. And the first thing is coming into alignment with the truth that God loves to speak, and you are designed to hear him. So often we buy the lie, maybe God speaks, but he's not talking to me. Maybe everybody else can hear him. I'm broken. Nobody else? It's just me sometimes? Okay. Here's the truth that we have to come into alignment with. God loves to speak. And you are designed to hear him. Friends, we are made for relationship with God. Why would God make us for relationship but forget to give us ways to communicate with each other? We're designed, your entire existence on this planet is to be in relationship with the living God. How are you going to be in a relationship with a God you cannot communicate with? God loves to speak. Your your actual existence is fruit of his speaking. His name is the word. Don't tell me you name yourself the word and not like to speak, right? His name is literally the word. He loves to speak. All throughout the Bible, we see a God through prophets, through experiences, through, you know, other people, through 
encounters, we see breaking bread, we see a God who is longing to communicate with his creation. We see a God who loves to speak. He'll speak through a, a donkey. He'll, he'll, it doesn't matter. He longs to speak through his communicate to his, to his children. God loves to speak. It's who he is. He didn't stop speaking when the Bible was done being written. He wasn't suddenly like, I have nothing left to say. He is the word. He is. It, it's who he is. He can't stop being who he is. God loves to speak. And at the same time, I love this. Let me read you a couple of verses. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Throughout our history, God has spoken to our ancestors by his prophets in many different ways. The revelation he gave them was only a fragment at a time, building one truth upon another. But to us, living in these last days, God now speaks to us openly. Tell me God doesn't speak. Try it. God now speaks to us openly in the language of a son, he appoint, the appointed heir of everything. For through him, God created the panorama of all things and all time. Jesus made a way for everybody to be able to hear God and experience God. Old Testament, it was like a few little prophets here and there. Gee, what Jesus did, he's, he makes a way for everybody to be able to hear God for themselves through the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? John 8, 47, these are the words of Jesus. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Deuteronomy 30, 14, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will silence you. Nope. I will answer you. I will ghost you. Nope. I will answer you. Call, God is not a liar. Call to me and I will answer you. And I'm going to tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. These are powerful promises. We belong to God. We can hear him. God is a God who speaks and you can hear him. Okay. So at the end today, we're going to actually practice this. So don't you worry. Uh, we're going to take some time to, to practice hearing him for ourselves because the prophetic flows out of your own relationship with God. The prophetic isn't just about a gifting. The prophetic should flow from your own ability to hear God for yourself, your own relationship, your own connection to him. From that place, we can speak life over somebody else. Okay? Okay, great. Okay, great. Just making sure. <laughs> God loves to speak. And then also in scripture, we see this reality that the Holy Spirit empowers us to be a witness. Jesus foretold what the Holy Spirit would do. He said in Acts 1-8, but you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses to tell people about, about me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be empowered to be a witness. That doesn't just mean you have to hand out tracts. Some of you are too young to even know about those days. <laughs> to be a witness. What is this word witness? This word martus that is used there. The Holy Spirit will come on you and make you a martus, a witness. Somebody who gives an account of what you've seen, heard, or knows to be true. It also means martyr. It's somebody who has experienced God and can communicate it. The Holy Spirit will empower you in a supernatural way, not a natural way. You don't need the Holy Spirit to communicate in a natural way. The Holy Spirit will empower you in a supernatural way to communicate the reality, the love, the hope of who God is to a generation. That can look different for everybody. That can be the Holy Spirit empowering you to tell stories that you couldn't have told before. That could be to, you know, empowering you to, to have the right language to speak into government or education or medicine. The Holy Spirit empowering you in a way that is not natural to release the heart of God. We're called to be witnesses, to experience him and to put him on display. Messengers, mouthpieces, sharing his heart for other people around us. And we see this at Pentecost 
right? We see when the Holy Spirit comes and fills um, the followers of Jesus, what happens? They begin to speak in other languages, and they're empowered to communicate in a new way. They were speaking in languages other people understood. You following? They suddenly could communicate the goodness of God in ways to people. They suddenly had an in to communicate to people they had no way to communicate to before. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in other languages. And everybody, you know, is in awe of what's happening. And Peter says, what's happening, you guys? What's happening right now? This is a fulfillment of what God said through the prophet Joel. Joel 2, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. As the Holy Spirit was being poured out on all people, we begin to hear accounts like the one in Acts 19.6. Then when Paul laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Over and over you see this in Scripture. When the Holy Spirit fills people, they begin to have an ability to communicate the heart of God to the world around them. They're empowered to speak in ways, to be a messenger, to be a voice, to speak life, to speak hope, to prophesy. They are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness. And you know, when we see the Holy Spirit being poured out in the early church, you don't just see a few prophets prophesying. You see everybody, the young, the old, men, women, everybody begins to to have this ability Everybody has access to the Holy Spirit. Everybody is now empowered to to release the heart of God. The Holy Spirit empowers us to become witnesses. The veil was torn. You know, before this moment, you needed a priest to go between you and God. A priest was no longer needed because you had access to God. Before this moment, there were prophets you waited on, hoped they got a word from God for you. There's no longer, yes, there were still priests and prophets, but their roles changed because of what Jesus did. Everybody could hear God. Everybody could be in relationship with God. Now when a prophet comes in and they, they release the word of the Lord, it's, it brings confirmation to what you're already hearing God do, God say, right? It, it, it just adds to it. It's beautiful, but it's no longer this, I need somebody else to hear God for me. We all have full access And we're all anointed by the Holy Spirit. Even if you're like, I am the biggest introvert on the planet. (laughs) Truly, get in line behind me, okay? (laughs) Because I am. So I don't know how you are if I am, and here I am holding a microphone, trying to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me. (laughs) The Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. The Holy Spirit is empowering you to release hope to people only you can release hope to. People he's called you to. Places he's called you to. We are all called to prophesy. We're all called to release hope in life. God loves to speak to his creation. And through the Holy Spirit, we're all empowered empowered to become a witness, to be part of how he speaks to the world around us. So what is prophecy? What is prophecy? You know, we're going to read in a minute a passage that says that we are to eagerly desire the prophetic. We are e- to e- be eager to, to want to prophesy. What does that mean? The word used for prophecy in the Greek, prophesy in the Greek, is prophetio. And what that means is to speak by divine inspiration, to teach, admonish, comfort, declare, or to foretell. You know what's so interesting? It wasn't until I really dug into the Greek that I realized prophecy is so much bigger than we thought it was, than I thought it was. I so often think about prophecy as like, in 27 days, this will happen to you. (laughs) Foretelling, that is a part of it sometimes. But also, to speak by divine inspiration? Have you ever just spoke by divine inspiration? You're like, that was way more wise than I am. I don't know why that came out of my mouth. (laughs) Right? To teach, to admonish, to comfort, to comfort, to declare. 
to speak truth over somebody, to speak, to speak truth when you see somebody swirling with lies, just to come in by the power of the Holy Spirit, just me to speak truth over who they are, to declare something over your city, over your region, over your family, over your health, over your body, over your children. That is the prophetic. You're literally putting words to what is in the heart of God and you're manifesting it on the earth, on earth as it is in heaven. You are putting words to what is in the heart of God. That is what the prophetic is. You are coming into alignment with truth and you are releasing it. It's, the prophetic is so important because for us to prophesy, it requires us to see people the way God sees them. And from that place, we help connect them to their creator. The prophetic is a tool to demonstrate to people how loved and valued and intimately known they are. Something I want you to think about when you think about the prophetic is this. Prophecy feels like Jesus. Prophecy feels like Jesus. When somebody is prophesying, it should feel like Jesus is in the room. And if it doesn't, you are not doing it right. Jesus always made people feel safe, valued, seen, loved. He could challenge people. I've had many a spanking from Jesus, and I just like, you are so amazing. I am so in love with you after. I don't know how I feel like so loved and cared for, even though I'm like, did he just spank me? I don't know. It's like, I feel so good right now. Like, only Jesus could do that. Jesus makes people feel so safe and loved and valued. And you know what scripture tells us? Many of you might know this, right? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to read it in two different translations for you. In the NLT, it it says, Revelations 19.10, the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. The essence of prophecy is to point people to Jesus, It's Jesus. It's prophecy smells like Jesus, tastes like Jesus, looks like Jesus, feels like Jesus. It's the essence of prophecy. It's who he is. In the children's Bible, I love it. It says, the truth about Jesus is the spirit that gives all prophecy. The spirit behind prophecy is the truth about Jesus, that he loves us, that he's good, that he's faithful, That who Jesus is, is the heartbeat and the essence of the prophetic. It's all about him. He's the point, he's the theme, he's the source, he's the substance of all prophecy. And prophecy should always help people connect to Jesus. If prophecy makes people want to push away from Jesus, we're doing it wrong. If prophecy makes people feel ashamed or fearful or you know, afraid of God, we're doing it wrong. That is not the heart and the essence of the prophetic. The prophetic is to help, help people connect to their creator. Second thing I want you thinking about with the prophetic. So it feels like Jesus. And the other thing is love is always the highest goal of the prophetic. Love is the highest goal of the prophetic. It's the driving force of the prophetic. If the prophetic is not flowing from love, it's out of alignment. The goal of the prophetic is love. If your goal is to merely be right, you've missed it. If your goal is to fix somebody, you've missed it. If your goal is to ooh and ah the crowd, you've definitely missed it. The goal of the prophetic is love. And if somebody is not feeling loved, you're doing it wrong. The goal of the prophetic is love. It's rooted in Jesus, and our goal is love. If your goal is to love somebody so well, you're going to hit the goal, and hopefully you get part of that word right. You know what I mean? Because You can prophesy the paint off the walls and then stand before God and he's like, you are a freaking glanging, ganging, um, banging, what is it? Clanging, thank you. A clanging gong to me. I did not know you, bro. 
You were good. Yep, you had a lot of gifting. I gave that to you for free. Should have developed some character with it. (laughs) Some relationship with me because you can do all these things. And he's like, but if you don't have love, you missed it. The goal of the prophetic is always love. I want to love you well. And the reality is we shouldn't be giving words to people we have not learned to love. Because last time I checked Facebook, (laughs) there's a lot of that going on. And it's not helpful. How many times we've told people that live somewhere else prophesying all kinds of nonsense over L.A.? Like, Excuse me, we reject your words, okay? You don't, love this, you don't love this place, clearly. You have no authority to speak over the destiny of my, my city. Sorry. Right? But same for us. We shouldn't be opening our mouth and prophesying to somebody we have not first asked the heart of God prayed for them, got in the heart of God for them, because prophecy has to come from love. It's not about my bias and my opinion and what I think God should do with you. It's none of that. It comes from love, okay? Love is always the highest goal. Um, I want to go through 1 Corinthians 14 a little bit. I've I've picked out some sections because it's too long, so just hang with me. I'm going to jump through. Starting at uh, verses 1 through 5, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. I mean, there are entire like schools of thought that think people in the church should not prophesy. I don't know how you get around the scripture. You should desire everything the Spirit has to give. If the Spirit's giving out gifts, get in line right? If it's from God, get in line, okay? Desire everything the the Spirit has, especially the ability to prophesy. Once again, the Greek word there that's used, the prophesy, it's an utterance inspired by God, the, the capacity or ability to utter inspired messages, okay? To speak under the influence of divine inspiration with or without reference to future events, Sometimes it might include future events, events sometimes it might not. Verse 2, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. Verse 3, but one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. This is the fruit of the prophetic. This is what the prophetic looks like. This is what the prophetic does. It strengthens, it encourages, and it comforts. That's where you live, right there. Strengthening, encouraging, and comforting. And so we ask ourselves, I'm getting a word for somebody, will this be strengthening to them? Or will this make them feel depleted? Will this encourage them? Or is it going to discourage them? Will this comfort them, or am I going to terrify them? Let's ask the Holy Spirit, right? This is is where this lives. I want to say something here, too, with this. um, Because when love is your goal, this is natural. If love is your goal, it's not the fruit it's going to produce when you're giving word to somebody that you actually love is they're going to feel strengthened, they're going to feel encouraged, and they're going to feel comforted. And I think sometimes people have been hurt by the prophetic. Um, I don't know the culture you grew up in, church culture. If you've been around a lot of different church cultures, um, you know, we travel a lot internationally. We do a lot of work internationally. We work with a lot of different, you know, backgrounds and churches. And it's always interesting to me how many different kind of church cultures have a very different perspective of the, of the prophetic. We were ministering recently in a, in a congregation where they were joking um, They were a primarily African community, and they were joking because they were saying, you know, for us, if, you know, in the country they're from, they're like, if somebody doesn't, like, shake violently and then fall to the ground after the word, we don't believe it was actually from God. (laughs) Fair, you know? Or other people, you know... um, it was very interesting to me that the very the first like very prophetic community I was involved in, um, 
you know, it was interesting because I had all these kids that were coming up, teenagers, and they were actually wounded by the prophetic. And it was very hard for me to get my head around because it was a very safe prophetic environment. It was very loving. They're, they would never have tolerated like manipulation or, or being abusive or saying ugly things with the prophetic. They, they were so nice. So I couldn't understand why all these kids were hurt by the prophetic. And when I dug into it, I actually found that in people's immaturity, um, they would just say anything that they thought might strengthen, encourage, and comfort, even if it wasn't from God. And so you have a whole generation of kids that had had 6,000 prophetic words that they were going to be the president, that they were going to be the A-list celebrity, that they were going to be whatever, and then they're all mad and disappointed in God that it didn't happen. So comforting, encouraging, strengthening isn't just making up whatever nice thing you want to say. That's also a false version of that, right? It's what is God actually saying? And listen, we deal with this all the time in LA, all the time, trying to help people unpack words. When, you know, many times people will say, well, you know, I've had five prophetic words that I was supposed to be, you know, fill in the blank. Let's use the most common, like an actor or something. And when you actually break down the words, it's like, oh, well, you know, And you talk to somebody who gave them the words, like, well, I felt like you were called to LA and I felt like you had, you know, you were called to influence. And so in my head, I just put those together and said, you're supposed to be an actor. Cool. So now this person is, you know, like trying to be faithful to steward the words God God has given them. But all of this is when love is our goal, we will do the work to lean in and really hear what God is saying, to truly strengthen, to truly encourage, and to truly comfort. Okay? We don't like lazy sloppy prophetic. It's something we grow in, we mature in, and we're accountable to, okay? Back to 1 Corinthians 14. You guys still with me? Okay. Um, I don't even know where we were. Verse 4, maybe. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Verse 5. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless somebody interprets what you're saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. If you jump down to verse 24, it says, but if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meetings, they'll be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. And then it ends in verse 39. So my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. And don't forbid speaking in tongues, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. Hallelujah. You guys already know this is my favorite thing to remind us, that the Holy Spirit and order can coexist. That's part of making me feel loved. Okay? They can coexist. Um, But we're instructed to be eager to prophesy. Be eager to be a mouth, to be a mouthpiece, to be a voice for your neighbors, your roommates. Your barista, people at your coworkers. <laughs> Be eager to ask God for words for folks. Be eager to release hope and life into the world around you. Be eager. You know, what happens when you prophesy what God is doing? What happens when you do that? First of all, let me just say this. Talk about being eager. I don't know about you, but I have rarely, rarely ever gotten a word for somebody that I didn't ask God for a word for. If I go into Trader Joe's, you better believe I'm not going to get a word for anybody in there. I'm not. It's already stressful. Too many carts. Why are you going the wrong way? I'm just trying to get, you know, it's too much for me. Okay, I'm not, I'm not just going to be like, oh my God, I was like grabbing snap peas and I just feel the Lord. That doesn't happen to me. Maybe it does to you. That is great. You are more spiritually inclined than I am. The only times usually I get a word for people is when I stop my busyness and I say, God, what do you want to say to her? And it's in those moments that I actually start to get something. Being eager to prophesy means we're willing to stop and ask. You're like, oh, I'm not getting words from my coworkers. When was the last time you asked God for a word for your coworker? 
And if you're like, oh, I asked, I got nothing. Well, what, you waited five minutes? Like, why don't you pray on that for a month? See if God would give you a word for your coworker. Being eager looks like, not just like checking the eager box. No, eager looks like something. It's putting in the effort to actually lean in. God, what are you saying to my mom? God, what are you saying to my sister? God, what are you saying to my friend? And I'll try to challenge myself to do this. Take some time, you know. I might be in the car like, God, is there, is there somebody you want to highlight to me today? Just a word of encouragement. He might drop somebody in my mind. And I try to make it a habit. Something as simple as just a text or a voice text. Like, hey, I was just praying for you today, thinking about you. This is what was on my heart. Boom. Like, it could be that simple. But being eager to prophesy looks like something, right? But what happens when we prophesy? And this is what's so powerful. I love Isaiah 55, um, 10 and 11, it says, as the snow and rain that fall from heaven don't return until they've accomplished their purpose, soaking the earth and causing it to sprout with new life, providing seed to sow and bread to eat, so also will be the word that I speak. It does not return to me unfulfilled. My word performs my purpose and fulfills the mission I sent it out to accomplish. This is what happens. Listen, the words of God are alive. They are alive. They are full of life. The word of God brings transformation. It doesn't come back empty. It does something. It creates. It changes. It shifts. It transforms. So when you align yourself with what God is saying over your kid, over your spouse, over your neighbor, when you align yourself with the words of God and you release it, listen, not just with your mouth, you dance it out, you paint it out. I don't care how you release it. Lots of ways to release the word of God. When you release what God is saying, it does not come back empty. Something begins to happen. It's like seeds in their soul. It just begins to sprout. Things begin to shift. Things begin to change. It goes to work. You deposit kingdom into somebody by just your words, and it begins to go to work. It begins to eat away at the fear. It begins to, to eat away at the anxiety. It begins to, to bring life. It begins to bring hope. It begins to supernaturally morph and do things in them. The word of God is living and active, and when we align ourselves with it and release it, you become an agent of transformation. You become a co-creator with God. So when you're looking at chaos and you begin to align with the heart of God over that chaos and you begin to speak truth and speak order and speak life, you become a co-creator with God to see order and life and truth released in that place. This is not religious hype. This is not name it, claim it. I'm, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we, when we line up with the word of God and we come into alignment with our mouth and our lives with it, you literally release the kingdom and the atmosphere around you. And the kingdom of God does not come back empty. It does what it, what it goes out to do. It accomplishes. It transforms. It's a very huge invitation for us. You know, this goes into why we need to be careful and stop speaking negatively. In the name of God, especially. Or politically, in the name of God or selfishly in the name of God, or through our own bias in the name of God, which we're going to hit on next week, don't you worry, <laughs> which we all have, right? Emotional intelligence goes hand in hand with the prophetic. People get hurt when, when people try to operate in the prophetic without emotional intelligence, because emotional intelligence requires you to understand that you have a bias and a lens, that you need to surrender. Emotional intelligence helps you to understand, you know what, that might be me. <laughs> right? Emotional intelligence goes together with the prophetic. So we're going to get more into that not next week. But, you know, it's interesting because when, when Jesus was talking about the end times, I'm not going to read it because of time, but there's a passage um, in Matthew 24, where he's talking about how the hearts of people are going to get hard and cold, and people are going to stop loving each other, and there's just going to be so many voices that are false, and, and all of this. And this, the reality is, the times we live in, friends, there are so many voices tearing people apart, dividing, bringing fear, bringing confusion. And I'm not just talking 
in the world. I'm talking people using the name of God. Saying God is fill in the blank. And there, there's literally so many voices that aren't speaking life and truth and hope. And there has never been a greater hour for witnesses, true witnesses to rise up. True witnesses, people who lean into the heart of God and can release it for the guy with tattoos at Walmart, for the guy on the street in Ecuador who is about to take his life. Oh, I didn't even tell you the end of that story, y'all. That man, he got so rocked by God that day, he gave the money he had to the woman, sent her on his way, and he he got reconciled with God that night. He went home reconciled with his wife and was sitting next to me in church the next day with his wife alive. And they got plugged in to the church there. I wonder how many transformations are on the other side of us learning to get over ourselves, get over our fear, get over our bias, and just start partnering with God. Because we are anointed by the Holy Spirit to be a mouthpiece. To be a mouthpiece. You know, it's funny is some of the the ones going to Ecuador, Victoria, call you out. She was telling me, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. I know, I just know it. They're going to like make me prophesy over somebody. I don't even know what I'm going to (laughs) say. And you know what the report I got about Victoria? is? She's prophesied over everybody the whole time. (laughs) (laughs) That you did that. But you see what happens? What's so beautiful about that, Victoria, is you just said, God, I'm willing. I'm willing. I don't, I don't have some big thing. I don't have some, I'm willing. And God just flows through you because you're anointed to do it. He's looking for our willingness. He's looking for our willingness. So it's time to be witnesses. And I want to say this, you know, God is raising up messengers and witnesses who are marked by love, truly marked by love, actual followers of Jesus, carriers of good news, and who are empowered to speak to the generation at hand. You know, it is a different day. It's a different hour. We are not talking to unchurched America. We're talking to, I was in church and I left America. We're talking to, I created my own religion, took bits of what I wanted from it and added my politics and my sin and myself and my own agenda to it. And I call it my religion. We're talking to idolatrous America. Let's be honest. And we need people who have love for the world. Because you can't influence what you don't love. People who can allow the Holy Spirit to speak hope and life and courage to the people around us in our day. God is raising up messengers. So this is what I want us to do. You know, next week we're going to get into into more of the practicals. I want to talk a little bit about, okay, wait, but like, can anybody ever give a hard word? How does that work? What's the difference between like everybody prophesying versus people who are like, you know, prophets, actual like, you know, office of prophet or, or gifting a prophet? What's the difference? Or how do we, you know, um, I want to talk a little bit about the power dynamics in, in the prophetic that everybody's equally powerful. The person giving the word is not more powerful than the person receiving the word. So the person receiving the word, if it's weird, can be like, that was weird. You know, like everybody's powerful. How do you process what you're hearing, what you're, you know, what you feel like God is saying? That we need community. So we want to dive into more of that next week. But I want to, I want to take a moment today. Bring us back to our first point. That God is a God who speaks, and I am designed to hear him. Period. I can hear him. God wants to speak to me. God loves to speak to me. In fact, even if you think you're not hearing him, the truth is you probably already are. You just have to learn to recognize it. We're going to do an exercise in a moment, but I want to just remind us of a few things. And I'm going to make it really simple because I hate when people make things too complicated. It drives me crazy. You see, there's a lot of ways that God speaks to us. I like to think of it as God has a lot of languages, not just Italian, German, Persian. Like, no, God has a lot of ways to speak. One of the ways God speaks might be that still small voice. 
right? You got to get really quiet to hear it. One of the ways God speaks might be the audible voice of God. Maybe you've been awakened like out of hearing the audible voice of God. One of the ways God speaks is through other people. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us through the word. It's like the biggest way God speaks. He's always speaking. You've probably seen somebody post that on Instagram, like, quit saying God doesn't talk to you if your Bible's closed, right? Like, open it. Like, he's speaking through the word. He speaks through nature. He speaks through signs. He speaks through dreams and visions and images. And most of us, most people, I would say, are prone to hearing God in a certain way. Like, there's a language you're most maybe attracted to or it's easier for you. Maybe you most hear God through images, Another way we hear God is through like, like spontaneous thoughts. You know, like in the cartoons when the little light bulb goes off, somebody's just like, ding, you know? It's like that. You're like, you're, you're not even thinking about something. All of a sudden, this idea pops in your head called a spontaneous thought. That's one of the languages of God. That's one of the way God speaks. Pay attention. Another way God speaks is feelings and impressions. You know, when you just have a feeling, you shouldn't go there. You just have this like impression you're supposed to call somebody. That's one of the ways God speaks. Pay attention. God is speaking in a lot of ways. Now, for those of you in this room who are multilingual, I find, right, there are certain things for me, I'm bilingual, for, there are certain things that are better said in Spanish. They're funnier in Spanish. There are certain things that are better said in English. It just doesn't work in Spanish. There are certain things maybe better said in sign language. We are in pursuit of learning to grow in all the ways God speaks. Because sometimes God giving you a picture could be more powerful than you being like, the only way I can hear him is through scripture. Right? So growing in all the ways God speaks. God speaks in all these ways. Pay attention to them. The other thing I want you to think about with this, I'm really simplifying this, but you get the idea. I think about this often as there are three voices we hear all the time, all day long, every day. We hear God's voice, which is truth. God is always speaking. There's always truth. I am loved. I am safe. I am, you know, whatever it is. God's voice is truth. We hear the enemy's voice, which are lies. You are stupid. God's, whatever it is. You're not good enough. There's just so many of us, those, those little like radio stations of lies have just been in the background for so long. We don't even recognize that we're hearing them right? We hear truth, we hear lies, and then we hear a whole bunch of our own voice. When is she seriously going to stop talking? I am so hungry. It's lunchtime, right? That's you. That is you, the devil. I'm not sure, but it's somewhere in that realm. Just kidding. But we hear our own voice. So I want you to be aware of that, okay? And the more you spend time with God and the more you spend time practicing, the easier it gets to distinguish, was that me? Was that God? Whenever it's the devil, we don't even entertain it. Get out, silence. I'm not listening to that in Jesus' name. We don't listen to it. If, it pre- if you hear something that makes you feel confused or afraid or shameful, that is not God. That's what the enemy's voice sounds like. God's voice is always safe and loving and encouraging, right? Our voice is all about ourselves. <laughs> what we want, what we think, our opinion. And I think where people tend to get stuck is what was me, what was God. And that's why we have, which we'll get into this more next week, but two things. One is you have to do the prophetic within community. Nobody is an island. You see in part and hear in part. You cannot do this on your own. You need other people to discern with you, was that God? Because my big old flesh has a big old voice also talking. So we need other people to discern with us. At the other, the other side of that is you also, as you're growing in relationship and practicing, you get familiar with the Lord's voice. You know, when my kids were little, we had this hallway. It was a rented house, and it was the worst idea. And these people put white carpet in the hallway, the most trafficked space. And I could not shampoo that carpet enough. I had three little kids. It was a disaster. But my kids knew, and they would. They were just, the, you know, I, had, I have strong old children. So they would literally lay on the line where the wood floor end and would eat their snack, but, would, you know, just right there. Because they knew you don't eat or drink on that carpet unless you want to die. There's no gentle parenting in my household, okay? 
eat there, you die. So if somebody would have walked in my house and said, here's some, some red punch, your mom said you can drink it on the carpet, my kids would have been like, <laughs> that was not something my mother would say. Heck no, dude. Absolutely not. You see, the more time you spend with God and you're in the word and you know his nature, you know the kinds of things he would say or not say. So there's, this has to be done in the context of relationship, right? So we hear three voices, the enemy's voice, God's voice, and our own voice. And I think sometimes what happens, and I, I, have, I teach it to kids like this, but I have to remind myself this. I expect the word of when God speaks to me, I expect it to be so like, I don't know, like in a different voice or like so profound that I like, I don't know, I don't recognize it. It's going to land in your own brain. So it's going to sound like your own thoughts. You're going to have to get over that. So much of my life, I was like, God, you don't speak to me. God, you don't speak to me. And I would say something, God would be like, you know, I am sick and tired of you taking credit for everything I've been telling you. And I was like, what? That was my thought. He's like, no, that was my thought that landed in your brain. Do you think it was going to land in your elbow? It lands in your own brain. So it's going to sound like your own thoughts. So you have to get over, I made it up, I made it up, I made it up. We, that's literally, if you're like me, what I did all the time. Convinced I was always making it up. The reality is, is it true? Truth is always true. Let me give you an example. You walk into Starbucks, you see somebody sitting there and they, they kind of feel highlighted to you, they feel sad, you don't know what's going on and you get this thought, oh, I feel like I should go talk to them, I should like pray for them or something. And then the next thought, oh my God, how embarrassing. They're going to be like, oh, who are you? Like, and make me feel weird. They're going to reject me and I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel so embarrassed. Ah! And then you get another thought that's like, why would God want to use me anyway? I was such a jerk this morning. <laughs> and yeah, you can see in like 10 seconds, you hear three voices. If you're like, well, was that me or was that God? Well, the reality is go love somebody and encourage somebody. Even if you think you made it up, that's in the Bible. You didn't. That's true. That's always true. Right? And then you see how our own thoughts are self-protecting. Well, what if I, you know, am embarrassed? And you see how the enemy tries to come in and bring shame. We have to practice hearing all the ways God speaks and getting confident that we can hear him. And last, I want to say this, and we're going we're to practice. We all have something called an image center. It's a place in your brain that you see pictures. You don't, you're not like some, only some super prophets have this like, you know, I don't know, like screen that drops down and they see, maybe they do, but we all have an image center. You could close your eyes right now and picture your bed and you would see it. You could close your eyes and pic picture your toothbrush. Hopefully that's not a problem for you. You could close your eyes and picture an ice cream cone and you could see it. Most of us have been told that our imagination is foolish and childish and that God doesn't work within the realm of imagination. But the reality is God made us for connection and relationship. And when I got saved, all of me got saved. So there's nothing impure about my imagination. When I bring it before the Lord, it becomes a tool through which God speaks to me, a place where I can see images. But part of it is we have to ask God to cleanse our image center because so many of us have been bombarded in our lives with a lot of images that cloud the image center. And we're going to pray right now. Let's actually do it together. Let's put our hands on our head. We're going to ask God to cleanse our image center. Lord, we invite you right now and we ask God that you would wash our image centers, that you would wash any impure images, any violent images, any um, sexual images, any Trauma, traumatizing images, Lord, any images that have been just stuck in our image center. God, I pray that you would wash and cleanse our image center, that our image center would be a safe and a holy place for you to meet with us, for you to encounter us. God, I want to see your images. I want to see what you want to show me. I want to have pictures and dreams and visions that are from you. We commit our image centers. We just cover them in the precious blood of Jesus. And we ask that they would be a clean and a quiet and a safe place. No more trauma, no more torment. We bless our image centers right now in Jesus' name. 
you put your hands down, but keep your eyes closed. Earlier we read the verse in Jeremiah 33, 3, where Jesus says, if you call to me, I will answer you. We're going to practice that this morning. We're going to ask God a question or two or three. And we're just going to see what happens. Now, because this is a practice and there's no like stoning of false prophets happening here, I want you to relax. For the sake of this exercise, here's the rule. You're not allowed to think you made it up. We're going to ask a question and something's either going to come as a thought, an an impression, a picture. I don't know how God's going to speak to you. But I want you just to be, to lean in and see what he says. And the first thing that pops in your mind, I want you just to, for the sake of this exercise, just trust maybe this is God. Don't try to change it. Don't be like, I don't like that answer. Next, no, just let it be what it is, okay? And we're gonna purposely ask a very simple question because I don't want you to get in your big adult head about it. So Jesus, we invite you into this place right now. Holy Spirit, I... I ask that you would come and speak to us. Your words as if we call, you're going to answer. We just tune down our own voices. We turn the volume down of our own thoughts right now. All of our own noise, internal noise, we just tune it down. And we lean into your spirit right now. And I thank you that you are a God who speaks and who wants to speak to us right now. So will you just ask this question with me. Say, Jesus, if you could pick any game to play with me right now, what would you pick? Pay attention to just the little thought, the impression, the picture. Don't try to change it. Don't say, I made it up. Now ask him, why did you pick this game? Why do you want to play this game with me? Ask him, what do you want to teach me through this game? Now using your image center, Jesus picked this game for a reason. So using your image center, I want you just to Imagine yourself playing this with Jesus. Just watch. What is he doing? You can ask questions. Why did you do that? Or what does that mean? Open your eyes for a moment. How many of you were able to see a game that God wanted to play with you? And you felt like you got, wow, look around. That's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. How many of you feel like you actually just had like a moment with Jesus? Like something just actually profoundly just happened in you by asking, what game do you want to play with me? We played chess or checkers or hopscotch or soccer. I don't know what you played. It's that simple. This should be part of how, like, every day in our lives, asking God questions. You know, when my kids were little, I would put them in bed every night, and and we would try to ask God, God, was there anything today that we did or said or thought that made you really proud? And then, God, was there anything we did or said or thought today that made you sad? 
like learning, making this a part of our culture of learning to hear him. Can we ask one last question before we close? You guys okay? Three people said yes. How about the rest of the room? One last question. That's it. I promise. Okay. Close your eyes. Jesus, if you could meet me anywhere today for a special date, where would you take me? Don't try to switch it. If it's a pretend place, that's okay. Just trust that he's trying to speak. Jesus, why did you pick this place? What's significant about this place? Jesus, what do you want to say to me in this place? Jesus, is there anything I'm supposed to leave in this place and not take with me anymore? shows you something, then just ask him, what am I to do with it? And Jesus, is there anything you want to give me in this place? Is there a gift you want to give me today in this place? in that place with Jesus that he chose. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. You know, it was a simple exercise. But the truth is, the more we do this, Simple questions. If, you know, if you struggle to hear, God, tell me what you're doing in the end times. Like, maybe just don't start with that question. (laughs) If you're struggling with God, how do I fix my marriage? Or God, how do I transform LA? Maybe just start with God. Do you want to play hopscotch? I mean, I don't know. Just start with... God, is there anything today? God, what do you love about me? God, if you were to walk into my house today, what would you do or what would you say? Draw a big heart in your journal and be like, God, show me what you see in my heart right now. And then start asking questions. How did that get there, God? That's weird. I agree. There's some doubt in there. What are we going to, just start asking questions. What do you want to do about that? We have to practice this, church. We get to grow in this. This is part, it's so life-giving. It's relationship. And I want to encourage you if you're like, oh my gosh, I heard nothing. It's okay. That was me for a lot of my life. I was convinced I could not hear God. Very dramatically as a teenager, I actually was like, I'm not going to eat or drink. I'm going to lock myself in my room until, and, and die there until God speaks to me. Because I was convinced I couldn't hear him. And that's when I really realized that like, oh, I actually hear him is just... I thought it was myself. It's practice. Don't be discouraged. God is speaking. And when I look around this room, as we just get ready to close, I, 
I am so convinced I am standing here among some of the most anointed and incredible witnesses that God has chosen in this day, in this hour. This is a room full of witnesses, prophetic voices that aren't going to maybe prophesy like your grandpa prophesied or the, the weird guy on Facebook prophesied, that are coming dripping with the essence of Jesus, that are coming with the goal of love, that are coming in the name and character and, and life of Jesus, ready to bring hope and life and encouragement. This is a room full of people that are already doing it. And I want to pray for us while you stand as we close. God, I pray for every person in this room. I pray, Lord, that we would become so rooted in you, so filled with the Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, that you have called us and empowered us to be a voice, a witness, a voice of hope, a voice of encouragement, voices of strategy, voices of love, I thank you for every person in this room. And God, I pray that we would become so in tune with what the Spirit is saying, that we would align ourselves, even our self-talk and the things we're saying over ourselves, over our business, over our, our marriage, over our health, that we would align our words with what you're saying. I thank you that this is a room full of co-creators called to co-create in this region with you. And I pray, God, that you would heal us, heal us of any wrong perspectives or woundings that have come from the prophetic or a wrong understanding of the prophetic. Would you heal us? And I pray, God, that you would anoint the voices and the people in this room to be powerful and pure demonstrators of who you are to the world around us. In your name we pray. Amen.